So let's go ahead and talk about APIs now. Um, so before we jump into that, let me introduce myself. My name is May. I am the student community manager at Postman and I use they, them pronouns, and I'm gonna be your lovely host for the day. So I have an agenda for the day. We're gonna talk about an introduction to APIs and Postman. What are these things? Why are people using them? Why do they matter? We're also gonna talk about requests and responses, which is our bread and butter for working with APIs. I'm gonna have the opportunity to try some things out. I'll give you some follow-up resources at the end and we will have time for Q&A at the end. But if you have any questions at all, please feel free to put them in the chat. So, before we start, what is an API? Does anyone have experience with APIs? I want to tackle this question first. Yo, Andrew's got it, application programming interface. So that is what it stands for. Um, as Andrew said, application programming interface, and an API allows services to talk to one another, communicate with each other. So over the years, software has become a lot more collaborative um, and a lot more complex. And so there's so much more software and more developers now than there's ever been in any point in history. So developers no longer need to create every single service from scratch. This is where APIs come in because APIs allow developers to access data from a service or a platform, kind of like Google or Twitter, without having any knowledge of how the code base has been implemented. So if I want to get tweets from Twitter using the Twitter API, I don't need to know how Twitter was created. I don't need to know how this API was created. It doesn't matter what language I'm using because this is just giving me raw access to data. So let's talk about APIs in a more high level overview. If I am in a restaurant um, and I'm looking at the menu, deciding what it is that I'm gonna order, once I've decided what I'm gonna order, I can't just waltz on to the back of the kitchen and make my demands, no. I have to talk to somebody. I either have to talk to the person at the front or I need to place an order with the waiter. So I decide what I want, I place my order and the waiter will go send that to the kitchen. Once the kitchen has my food, the waiter's going to come back with it and bring it to me. Or if they were out of that that day, the waiter's going to come back and say, actually, we don't have that today. Can you please order something else? So when working with an API, this is on a base level, really how it's working. Um, somebody is going to be making requests to a server. But those requests are going to go to an API. The API is going to just work as the communicator gonna work back and forth between you and the server to bring you data, but also bring requests for data to the server as well. Similarly, the API also is kind of a first line of defense. And if we think about waiters at a restaurant, they're also kind of a first line of defense, right? If I am ordering alcohol, for example, I need to show my ID before the waiter can even place that order. And so, the waiter is really acting as that first line of defense. In some restaurants, you need to pay first before you can actually get your order made. Um, so that's another kind of line of security that your API would be able to handle as well. So that's a very high level overview. Um, <laughs> Sorry, right before this workshop, my nose started bleeding. I am still feeling the effects of it, which is why my camera is not on. Um, so if you hear me coughing, that's why. Um, anyways, so that was a high level overview of what APIs are, talking about it in the sense of a restaurant. Let's talk about it in a more technical sense now. So if I am at a restaurant, or <laughs> never mind, not at a restaurant, if I'm going to make a um, post on Instagram, there's a couple of things that need to happen first. So first I'm going to open up the Instagram app on my phone and I'm going to press that lovely little plus button in order to create a new photo, take a new photo. Um, the Instagram app is actually going to open the camera app on my phone and just overlay itself on top. So I take the photo, the camera app on my phone is going to take that photo and send it back to Instagram. This is why when you take photos on Instagram, um, you'll end up with a lower resolution copy of it in your camera roll. 
because the camera app on your phone is also just taking the photo. Um, this goes back to Instagram. There's a filter that's automatically applied to every Instagram post, but then you can add whatever, whatever else you would like, other filters, more text, any hashtags you need in order to create the post of your dreams. Once you are done and ready for that to go, you're ready for that to be uploaded and shared with the world. You're gonna click on upload. But before your post reaches anybody else, it's going from your app to a remote server because right now the post is on your app. So nobody else can see it. It has to go to the remote server. So it's sent to a remote server. This is a cloud server, probably owned by Instagram or Facebook. And then once it's on that server, it's widely accessible to anybody. So it's now part of the social network because that social network is on the server. So there's a lot of moving parts in this particular example. Um, how many APIs do you think are in play? And you can just tell me in the chat. A lot. That's fair. That's a totally fair answer. Um, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It is less than five in this example. <laughs> three. It's three, actually. Um, can you take a guess at which things have their own API? I know Alex said that the Instagram has the Instagram app has an API, which is true. Um, what are the other APIs that we are using in this example? The camera app. Yes, that's definitely one. So we have the Instagram API, which is the software API um, that's making requests and also accepting data from uh, your camera. Um, the camera app has its own hardware API, so that allows it to be opened by other apps and take photos and send those around. Um, and then the remote server itself actually has an API. So like I said, the posts that you take on your app before they're uploaded, they just exist on your app. So nobody else can see them because it's just existing on your phone in that moment. So once you actually upload it, it's going to the remote server. So this remote server is what connects your app to the overall social network. Similarly, this remote server is what's sending updates to your app as well, because this has all of the new updates. Um, so whenever your app is getting updated, it's receiving a request to update from the remote server. So yeah, great job, everybody. There is an API for everything. We, we just talked about how we have hardware APIs, APIs for your apps, APIs for your servers. There really is an API for everything. And I really do mean that. So we have APIs for platforms and services that you've probably used before, like Spotify, Twitter, and Discord. Um, but there's also APIs for smaller services that you maybe haven't used before or are just familiar with. Um, we have the cat API, which is my personal favorite. It just shows you different photos of cats. Um, we've got YouTube to MP3, which is another one that I'm a huge fan of, um, primarily because YouTube to MP3, I was first familiar with it as a library. And I think this is a great example for how APIs work, right? Because when you import a library into your, um, your application, your program. Um, it's specific to that language that you're working out of, but it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. For example, hashing libraries. There's some things that you shouldn't create completely from scratch on your own. There's a library that you should use instead. NumPy is also a great example of doing a lot of heavy lifting for you. And so I know that I personally have had a lot of times when I was writing in Python thinking NumPy would be great if it existed in other languages as well. That is the drawback of a library. It is connected just to that language that it's built in. Um, but there are APIs 
that can do that same thing and essentially act as a library, but for any language that you're programming in. And so I'm familiar with YouTube to MP3. It takes YouTube links and converts them to MP3 files as a node package. Um, but now that there is an API, I'm no longer forced to just use node in order to use this functionality. I can use this in a Python application, for example. So that is one of the beauties of APIs. See, we have something in the chat, an API for making APIs. I am pretty sure something like that exists. <laughs> um, I cannot say for certain, but at the end, I will, I will find a resource for you to prove that. <laughs> so the thing that's really cool about APIs is that they turn software into Lego bricks, similar to how we can pick and choose the things that we want from a library. We pick and choose the Lego bricks that we want in order to build whatever it is that we're making. Like when we're kids, making all of our little houses. If you were like me, I would make a lot of barns. I was, uh, I was into making Lego barns for my animals as a child. Um, so I need to make sure that I have the right bricks in order to do that. And that's how we can approach software now. We can use APIs to kind of take and pick and choose the right pieces for what it is we're trying to create and just stick them where they need to go in order to create our overall piece of software, which makes it a lot more efficient. It makes it, the performance a lot better and it just saves a lot of time in development as well. So we've talked about APIs in a very broad high level overview. So let's talk about APIs in a more dry technical way, um, because these are probably the words and terms that you're going to see um, if you look at further documentation about APIs as well. So an API acts as a mediator between a client and a server to provide access to data and services. And so in this case, a client can be anything from a website to a mobile app to your web browser. And the client is going to make requests to API endpoints on the server. So if we think about the restaurant example from earlier, I was the client because I was making a request. Um, the waiter was the API because that is the person uh, honoring my request. And then the server would have been the kitchen because that's where all the good stuff is. Um, and so the API, API is working between the server and the client um, to kind of usher back and forth different data, different, different requests to be honored. So today we're gonna to be using Postman as a client and we're going to make some requests to a demo API to retrieve, add, update, and delete data. But before we get into that, what is Postman? Um, before I go on to answer this, has anybody used Postman before? Is anyone familiar with Postman? API testing, okay. So Akash is familiar, that's great. Um, yeah, so Postman is a collaborative platform for API development, really for testing, developing, and using um, APIs. And it really um, simplifies the process by wrapping it all nicely in a little UI. Okay, Joy has also used it before for testing. Wonderful, um, I'm so happy to see this. So when I had started, before I worked at Postman, I had been familiar with Postman when it was just a humble little Google app, um, when Google apps were still a thing, or like Chrome apps were still a thing. Um, and I was using it to test my APIs as well. Um, now I can see all the wonderful things that you can do with it. So back in the old days of working with APIs, we used a command line tool called curl. And so command lines are wonderful. They're so powerful. However, there's some drawbacks. Editing something can just be a huge pain um, because everything is in black and white and huge blocks of text. It can be really hard to parse through all of the data that you get in your output response as well. And so there's a lot of limitations with curl, especially as your um, requests start getting bigger and more complicated. And so Postman came along and really simplified this process by taking everything, every functionality of curl 
and putting it into a UI so that it was easier for humans to actually do the things that they want to do, make more sophisticated and complicated requests, and added some more developer tools in as well to really help out developers who are testing their APIs. Let's see, we have something, a question, which for some reason is not loading. I am so sorry, <laughs> I will get to your question. Um, I will just have to get to it towards the end of the workshop, or you can ask it again in the chat. How can I, being a beginner, use this for my project at this hackathon? Well, we're actually going to be going over that today um, because we're gonna have the opportunity to work with Postman and try some things out. And we're gonna be working with a demo API. So you're gonna be learning about APIs and you'll get the opportunity to work with Postman as well. And hopefully they'll give you some ideas for your hackathon projects. So let's talk about request and responses. This is the bread and butter of working with APIs. So a request is how we interact with the API, and it has three main ingredients to it. We have method, which is essentially your action it is what you're trying to get out of this interaction. Um, it is your goal for this interaction. We have the address or endpoint. This is the URL. This is where you're going to be sending your request. And then we have the path. And the path is kind of specifying um, Think of it as like a subfolder, right? Trying to find the right place to actually put your request, send this data, who is gonna be the right department to talk to for getting this request honored. So we're gonna talk about all of these things in more detail now. So first up, we have HTTP methods, which specifies what we want from the API. So there are a lot of methods, but I'm only gonna focus on these four because Honestly, these are the only four that you need to know in order to get started with any API. So we have get, which is how we retrieve information. So if I'm going to use the Twitter API, for example, and I want to get tweets, I would make a get request. Post, which is how we send information. If I wanted to make a tweet programmatically with the API, I would send a post request. Put, which is how we update information. If I wanted to update my profile, for example, I would make a put request to do that and delete, which is how we delete information. So if I wanted to delete my tweet, I would send a delete request. Next up, we have endpoints and paths. So this is where our interaction with the API takes place. And so an endpoint is really just a channel of communication for the API. And this is typically a URL. The endpoint you can think of as an address. Um, the path is a destination on the endpoint where your request can be heard and executed. So if we think about this in more um, broader terms, sending a request to an API is kind of like sending a piece of mail. The endpoint would be the address that you would put on that piece of mail. Um, but let's say that I'm sending a piece of mail to my friend who lives in an apartment complex. Well, I need to make sure that I put her unit number down because otherwise it'll just go to the general building. The endpoint is like the address of the overall building. The path is like my friend's unit number. That's her apartment number, making sure that I'm actually sending this request to the right person. And so in this example, we have LinkedIn.com. That is the endpoint. That is where we would be sending this um, interaction, this request. And then we have the path feed. So when you log into LinkedIn, what you see first is the feed. Um, so there's a couple of things I can do on the feed. I can like posts, I can share posts, I can make posts. Um, if I wanted to do something like say, add a new job to my profile, I wouldn't do that on the feed path because that's not what the feed is taking care of. I would do that on the profile path. Just like if we're using the website as it is, he wouldn't update your profile through the feed, you would have to click on your profile and go to be redirected to the profile path. Um, similarly, if I wanted to add connections, I would do that in the connection path. I would not do that um, on my profile or on the feed. So these are the basics, right? 
But we also have um, some more things that we can specify detail with. And so I'm going to talk about all of those. Um, so first up is parameters, query parameters. If you have ever worked with a database before, you have probably used query parameters before. For. Um, it's really a way for you to specify exactly what kind of data, what kind of response you want back from this request. And so if I'm using the Twitter API, for example, and I'm going to search for tweets, I would do this. Oh, can I go back, back the page one more time? Yeah. You just want me to stay on the endpoints and paths page. Who gets to post or delete? Is this something that gets regulated by the API? That is a wonderful question. So yes, this is regulated by the API. Um, actually, what I was gonna talk about next after um, the, um, uh, path parameters was authorization. And so we're actually going to cover exactly that. So are we, are we good to move forward? Um, I know someone wanted me to move back. Uh, Rosie, are we good to move forward? Awesome. And I will also be giving you the link to the slides at the end. So you will be able to go back and refer to anything. So if you feel like you need to take notes, don't worry, you will have the slides. So um, if I continue talking about query parameters, if I am going to make a uh, request for tweets, for example, on um, Twitter, I'm going to search for tweets, right? They have a search method. They have a search uh, path that I can look for a tweet. So I can't just go on search. I need to specify what it is that I'm searching for. So let's say I want cat tweets. Um, cats would be my query parameter that's specifying what I want. Um, but there's some other things I can do too, because there's a lot of tweets about cats on Twitter. So if I want to get more specifically tweets that are about um, cats, but I only want tweets about cats from today, I can specify that all of these tweets have to be from today. I can specify that I only want to see 10 tweets at a time. I don't want all of them because, again, that's a lot of tweets. So query parameters allow us to get as specific as possible, get very granular with our request to get exactly what we want. Then next up is auth. So auth is a really big topic, so big, in fact, we have an hour and a half workshop dedicated alone to this topic. Um, so I'm only going to be talking about it a bit briefly. Um, but this will answer the question of who gets to post and delete, because this is something that the API regulates. I mentioned earlier that the API um, is your first line of defense and security, just like how if I'm at a restaurant and I'm ordering alcohol, the waiter is going to check my ID first to make sure that I can actually order it. Um, that's kind of what the API is going to do too. The API is going to require you to have a certain set of auth credentials for certain kinds of requests. So in general, an API key is needed for most kinds of requests, typically requests just to get data that you can already publicly access. Um, the reason that we have API keys is to protect both your programs and to protect the API itself. If somebody is, say, abusing the platform, um, their API key is giving them access to use this API. The developers of said API can revoke that key if you violate the terms of service. Um, Similarly, if your key gets taken for some reason um, or stolen and somebody is hijacking your own um, um, program, you can revoke access to that key so that no one can use it anymore. So that is like our first level, that's authentication. Then we have authorization, which is making sure that you're actually allowed to do the thing that you're trying to do. So if I want to send a tweet, for example, through my account, that's a post request, I need to make sure that I have 
a certain set of credentials. These are called OAuth credentials. Um, and it has a lot of different things, a lot of different details from tokens to access IDs to client secrets, all of these kinds of things. So I would send all of that information to the API so that API can verify that I actually have the rights to send tweets through the account that I'm trying to send them through. So that's what authorization takes care of. The same thing goes for deleting. If I'm going to delete something from my personal account, I need to make sure that I am authorized to do that. So this also ties into the next thing I wanna talk about, which is how we send data. So the API is the one that is concerned with authorization details. The server is not concerned with your authorization details. So we wanna make sure that we're not sending these details to the server. That's why we send them in the header of our request, the headers for metadata. So anything that is gonna be sent to the API itself, um, you would send that through the header, such as your auth details. If I'm trying to send a tweet, for example, my auth details are gonna be in the header of my request. The actual tweet that I want to send, is gonna be in the body of my request because the body is how we send data to the server. So that is request. But when we make a request, we're not just calling out into the void because the void is calling back to us. We get a response. So responses have two main elements. Number one is status codes. This is basically telling you at a glance what happened when you sent your request. And so these can be anything from like 200 okay, everything is good, 201 created, you created something, congratulations. Basically anything with a two in front of it is a good sign. Um, status codes you've probably seen before, like 404 not found. Um, 404 not found, um, 403 forbidden, 400, these are generally error messages. So these different codes give us at a glance information about our request, and then we can kind of troubleshoot from there if we need to. Then we also have body data. So just like we can send data in the body, we can receive data in the body of our response. So if I want to do a GET request, that data is gonna be in the body of my response. Um, so we can access this data as well. This data is usually in a JSON format, um, JavaScript object notation, but sometimes it's also in things like HTML and XML. So let's get into actually making requests now. We're going to switch gears. I'm going to send a link in the chat so everyone can feel free to click on that. You don't have to download anything. We're going to be using Postman in the web client. You're just going to need to create an account. So if y'all could tell me in the chat when you're ready for me to kind of keep moving forward, that'd be great. Um, normally when I do these uh, workshops, I'm with, I'm not in the webinar form, so I can see <laughs> what people's cameras look like and stuff, and they'll just give me a thumbs up. Um, so if y'all could tell me in the chat, that would be super helpful. <laughs> Joy is ready. I I love it. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So, <laughs> well, uh, Andrew doesn't see the link. Oh, let me. I sent this to the wrong group before. <laughs> um, so now it should be to everybody. Um, all right. Perfect. Cool. So, love it. While people are doing that, I'll just briefly explain what it is we're going to be doing today um, and explain what it is you see on the screen. So, when you click on that link after you've made an account, um, which doesn't take too long, you can see a page that looks like this. It says Fork Collection. If you're familiar with GitHub, 
Um, what we are working out of right now is called a workspace. It's similar to a GitHub repository. Um, now these workspaces are wonderful because you can collaborate with other people. And we have these little folders over here. Um, each of them have a different name. These folders are called collections. And so a collection is what it sounds like. It is a collection of things. Um, now these things are going to be API request in this particular case. So the collection that we are working with is called basics of API part one. It's just an introduction to working with APIs, making API requests. We're not gonna be building anything. We're just going to be testing some things out and learning hands-on. Um, so we have what's called forks, which is the same as when you're forking something in GitHub, forking a new branch, forking a repository. It is making a copy of something. So we're going to make a, we're going to fork this collection. Um, I'm going to give it a label. So I'll call mine TO hacks. And you can call yours whatever you want. You can also call it TO hacks um, if you so desire. Then you choose where you want this to be copied to. So you probably have the workspace, my workspace, as the place that you can fork make the fork. Um, I have a workspace for these kinds of workshops, so I'm going to fork mine there, and then I'm going to click on fork collection. And when I do that, it will reload the page and take me to my um, workspace. So if people can give me a notification in the chat just to let me know when they have forked and they are ready to move forward. Forked, wonderful, <laughs> ready, awesome. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I will quickly show you something, um, but I want to talk a little bit about documentation because documentation is super, super important. If you are ever, if you have spent your time in this workshop wondering things like, okay, endpoints and paths, these sound cool and all, but how do I know what path I can do what on? Um, the documentation is how you're going to learn that. So this particular API that we're going to be using, we actually have a couple of different options to use it. Um, there's a couple of different APIs within this endpoint link. And so we can work out of the quote API, is how you add new quotes, the joke API for adding new jokes, and the book API for adding new books. Um, and so I'll let y'all decide which API should we use today. Books. All right. I like books. <laughs> um, uh, my my dream, um, oh, Google speech to text, <laughs> that would be wonderful. Um, but in this case, we're using APIs that we have, that the Postman team has actually created for these kinds of workshops. Um, because things like uh, a lot of external APIs require a lot of authentication, and that requires a lot more explanation and setup. And we really want you to be able to work with an API right off the bat. So we created something that kind of scaffolds that down for you. Um, so we're going to be working out of the books API today. Um, and the documentation is going to tell us everything that we need to do. So the documentation tells us everything that we need to do for each of these APIs under this um, endpoint. So this endpoint is actually hosting three separate APIs. We're going to be using the path slash book to be working out of the book API. If you scroll down in the um, documentation, there will be making requests for books API with the book path. So we can get a random book, we can get specific books, we can send new books, update our books, and delete them. And we can actually, if you go to this URL um, and go to 
slash book slash review, you can see everything as well. So the fun thing about this API is that it's live data. So anything that we add, we're going to be able to see on the screen. Um, I want to reiterate that other people can see the things that you post. Um, so keep that in mind. But we're going to be able to see all of the books that we're adding to this collection. So we're like making our own little library. How awesome is that? Um, so we're going to be referring to the documentation actually throughout the entirety of this workshop because documentation is so, so, so important for working with any API because it's going to give you your whole menu of options for what it is you're working with. Um, but before we get into that, I want to show you something real quick. So you don't have to follow along with this, um, although you're more than welcome to if you want. Um, so I'm going to add a new request. I'm going to call it Get Google. And I can click on this drop down here. Let me give you a little overview. Um, this is the request pane. So this is where I'm going to be making all of my requests. Um, this is where I can select the method. Get is the method I want to use in this case. So I'm going to use that. And then I can add my endpoint. And it's going to be google.com. And so down here is my response pane. When I click send, I get a response back. Status 200 OK. And so I'm looking through and I get HTML back. So that is the response that I got from doing this get request. Um, it's nicely formatted because we're under the pretty view right now. If I click on raw, everything will be in one string, which isn't super helpful when we're looking at HTML. But if I click on preview, it will show me a rendered version of that HTML. So I see a rendered version of the Google website. This is all good well and good and all of that, but I'm not on Google to just look at the web page. I want to search for things. So we can actually add a query parameter in order to search. Um, so under params, I have a key value pairing system. So the key I'm going to use is called Q. This stands for query. This is pretty standard among most APIs as well. Um, but your, your mileage may vary depending on what API you're using. So always check the documentation before you um, start playing around with these kinds of things. And then the value I'm going to search for is Postman. So that will be my query. And notice that when I type this in this little params section, it builds out the request up top in the request URL. So if I click send now, I get status 200 OK again. However, Postman is just in the little box right here. It is not showing me the actual search results. Does anyone have a guess for why that is? And you can feel free to put that in the chat. because we need to push the request because it needs to be posted. So we do want to get a get request. The logic here is that we're doing, we are getting results from Google. Um, so we are not sending new information we're just requesting existing information that Google can, that Google can search for. Um, but there's something missing in this request. Um, and it's not necessarily an action that we need to do. It's something that we left out in the uh, request URL. Not a header, because that's how we would send information, um, metadata, if you will, to the API. In this particular case, the endpoint that I'm using is google.com. However, I'm not telling the API, the Google API in this case, that I want to search for anything because I'm just sending my query to the um, Google landing page, right? The actual page in order to search for something is slash search. So that is the path that I need to make sure that I'm using as well. So now that I've done that, I actually get all of the results. And I can test this out. If I just copy and paste this and paste that right in to my 
um, browser, it will show me all of the search results. So in this case, um, let's see, I got a question in the chat. So you missed the endpoint. It wasn't the endpoint that I missed because the endpoint was google.com. That is the place that I am generally sending my uh, request to. It's the path, the path that I needed in order to be heard, essentially. It's like, if I'm at the, if I'm trying to go to send my bill to my dentist office, but that dentist is based out of a business park and there's an optometrist and there's a law firm and there's all these other businesses, the path that's like making sure that I'm sending my bill, uh, my payment for my bill, specifically to my dentist and not to anybody else in the building. And so search is where we, the path that we want to make sure we're sending this request to in order to get exactly what we want. So I like to bring this up in every workshop that I do um, because I want people to see how we actually work with APIs every day already. And for the most part, we're not aware of it. Um, even doing a GET request, for example, that just brought me back HTML, right? And so when I previewed it, I could see a rendered version. That's the same thing as just going to google.com in my browser because my browser is actually doing a GET request. Anytime you go on any website, you're actually using APIs. You're making a GET request to that website to bring back the HTML. So this is a really cool example of how we work with APIs every day. Um, I like to bring it up because we often think of platforms like Google and Twitter as these huge monoliths, but in reality, we're just working with these things every day. And in this workshop, we're learning the building blocks to make something similar. So I think that's super powerful, and I love to share that with everyone. Anyways, that is enough lecturing. Let's create a library. Um, so I'm going to go back to the documentation, and I would ask for you to do that as well because you need to copy this endpoint. And we're gonna get to, we're gonna go to this request that's already in the collection that says get data, and I'm gonna add the URL there. And we're working out of the books API. So it's slash book is the path. And this should just give us a random book. And it does. So we notice the difference um, when we're looking at the view. Um, this is showing us what everything is rendered as when we are looking in this version. Um, we are seeing the HTML. And so it's not rendered all nicely into a little card, but uh, not the HTML, the JSON for it. Um, but this JSON is super important because this is the data structure that we're going to be using. So we're going to be uh, using, if you've never worked with JSON before, it is JavaScript object notation. So everything is between two brackets. Um, everything between these two brackets is an object. Everything on the left-hand side of these colons is the key. Um, all of the keys will also be color-coded co to be like this rust color. Um, everything on the right-hand side is a value. So the keys are things that must be there. Um, you can think of it as the syntax for this data, how it must be presented. Um, everything on the right-hand side is a value. So this is information that we're going to input ourselves. So everything has an ID which is the ID of that object itself. It has an author, a name, a book name, and then a link to that book. So just like the Google search for that book. If I click send again, I should get, there we go. <laughs> um, it is random. However, randomness also means sometimes you're gonna get the same thing over and over. Um, I should get a random book when I click send. So now I have the Harry Potter books. Um, now we have um, a book about Steve Jobs. So all of these random books I'm able to get. Notice since there is an ID, I can actually search for these books by their ID as well. If I add another forward slash, and then I say one, I'll get 
the Harry Potter books. And if I click send a couple of times, it won't show me a random book anymore because it's just showing me the one that I asked to see in the first place. So that's how we get data. Now it's time for us to send some data now that we understand how the data works a little bit better. So go ahead and add a new request. Click on those three dots at the top of your collection folder and click add request. Send book. That's what I'm going to call it. And then we're using the same endpoint and path. So it's just the postman student.heroku.com slash book. And then out of these options up here, which method am I going to use to um, send a request? Or like to send data? to the server. Post, perfect. We're gonna do a post request. All right, and now I'm gonna go ahead and save this. So go ahead and save that. And let's go back to the documentation to see what we need in order to send a post request. So if I scroll all the way down to making requests for books, this is all the way at the bottom, by the way. So you can just scroll all the way to the bottom. Let's see, post to send a new book. It's using the same um, path. And then we use the exact same structure. So we go ahead and just, you can go ahead and just copy this. There's a little copy button. So we're going to use the same structure for every book that we saw that we got. We're going to send data in this format. So go ahead and head back to your post request, send book. Where it says params, there's all of these other options too. We have authorization, headers, and then we have body. By default, body is set to none. We're going to click on the little radio button that says raw because we are sending raw data. So go ahead and paste that in. I want to point out that if you were to send this right now, you would get an error. Um, so make sure that you have this set to JSON, not text. Um, if it's set to text, the all of the text will be black. If it is set to JSON, all of the text will be color coded. So that's how you know you're using the right thing. Um, your ID needs to be set to something that is not currently in the um, server. So if you look at the view, for example, we have one, two, three. Uh, it's starting from zero. So it's zero, one, two, three. So everything from four and beyond is free game. You're going to be adding this ID yourself. Um, I'm going to choose 89. Please do not take my ID because <laughs> I will be sad. Um, so try to come up with a unique ID for this. Um, let's see. I'm going to add a book by Zora Neale Hurston called Meals and Men. It's a great book about folklore. Um, and I'm not going to find the link for it right now. So I'm just going to say google.com. <laughs> that will be the link. And so if I go ahead and click send now, I get 201 created because I have successfully created this piece of media. And I can see all of the options down here. Everything that I put in the body of my request is in the body of my response. I can verify this by going to the book view. Oh, there's so many. Um, I love to see people adding. Um, I can see my um, book up here. I can see other people's books up here. There's more books getting added. I love to see it. This is so great. Um, so yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a wonderful book, by the way. Highly recommend it. So awesome. It looks like people have had no problem um, creating. You get 400 bad requests. Oh no. Let's see. I love how I was saying, looks like no one's had any problem creating these. Um, but we have an error. So if you're getting an error, I'm going to ask that you make sure that you have raw selected, um, that you have JSON selected from this dropdown, 
and that you have all of this information filled out, but your ID needs to be unique. Um, it doesn't matter if you choose the same book as somebody else. Um, you just need to have a unique ID. So I could add, let's see, I could add this again, but because it's a different ID, it's totally fine. And if I reload the page, I'll see it twice. Um, so go ahead and make sure that you have all of these features figured out. Um, and for the rest of us, now that we have sent something, we can also feel free to update it. So go ahead and add another request. Call it update book. We're going to use that same combination and point and path combination. And then out of these options from the drop down, what am I going to want to use to update? I want to update something that is in the server, which method am I going to use? Put! Yeah! <laughs> Joy is really getting into it, and I love this. So we're going to do a put request. Um, go ahead and save this, and then we're going to head back to the documentation one more time. We're going to see what we need in order to update. So in order to update something, we actually just need to have the entire object in the body of our request. Um, keep the ID the same, but you're going to update the book itself. Um, so I'm going to uh, go to, you can go ahead and copy what it was that you posted before. Um, copy exactly that. Once again, go to body, click on raw and JSON from that little dropdown, paste that in, leave the ID as is, but feel free to change everything else. So I'm going to have a book by Louisa Teach. Um, it's called Jambalaya. And now when I click send, I get 204 no content. This is actually very good. Um, it means your request was successful. There's just nothing being put into the body of your response. And that's totally okay. This is why we love to look at status codes. So I have updated it now. If I reload the page, I'll see it has been updated. Jambalaya by Luisha Tish. Um, and I see that some other people have already began updating. So that's wonderful as well. So now that we have been able to update um, our original request, what comes up must come down. But before that, let me explain something real quick. Um, when making a put request, we do actually have to have the entire object in the um, body, even if we're just changing one thing, even if I were just to change the author or the book name. Notice I didn't change the Google link. Um, we need to have the entire object in for put. There is another method called patch, but that requires your API to be built in a specific way for you to update specific parts of the object by its ID itself. Um, so that's just one little caveat that I want to mention because I know sometimes people get confused with it. But like I said, what comes up must come down. Looks like a lot of people have been able to up <laughs> Cat in the Hat 2.1. <laughs> Dr. Seuss 2.1, wonderful, wonderful. Um, looks like everyone's been able to update and work with this. That's wonderful. What comes up must come down. So it's come time for us to delete our request now. So delete our books now. So delete. Book. Make sure that you're only deleting your book, by the way, not somebody else's book. Um, I've dealt with that before in previous workshops. Um, yeah, don't delete other people's work. Let's head back to the documentation one last time. Scroll all the way to the bottom to delete a book. 
it is the book path and the ID of the book that we are deleting. So I had a couple of things that I had added. So I'm just gonna delete the additional um, book that I had made. Um, notice that this whole structure, you know, endpoint, book path, ID is the same thing as getting a specific um, item. So if I click send here, I'll get 200 OK, which is what I want to get. Book with this ID is deleted. Wonderful. If I go back to the view, I'll see that it is now it has now gone goodbye. Also, I just noticed that someone added Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency to this list, and I love that. I love everything about that. Good for you. Um, but if I reload, I see people are now deleting um, the books that they have added. So that's nice to see. Everyone's catching up. Wonderful. Awesome. Cool. So we did it with two minutes to spare. So I'm going to quickly, quickly go through the rest of the slides that I have because I know there are other workshops after me. Um, so just to recap, we talked about endpoints, methods, and paths, and body data, and we got to use all of these things, and it was beautiful, and I'm so proud of each and every one of you. If you would like your chance to earn some swag, you can create a public workspace with a collection using any API of your choice, send it to us, and we'll send you cool swag, and I will share the form to do that because there's also the survey form. So if everyone could do me a big, big favor and fill this out. I know that you have um, a lot of different survey forms probably to fill out at this event, um, but if you would like to earn some swag, you can add your work, uh, your workspace link. You could even add, if you're using um, uh, APIs in your um, hackathon project, you can send that to us. Um, just an example of, how you're using APIs, but also if you could please fill out that survey link, it would mean so much to me because I need to know how these workshops are going, if they're helpful for people, and what you're learning. Um, so that's super helpful for me. Here are some APIs that you can try out, which reminds me, let me send the link to these as well, uh, the slides. These are the slides. <laughs> um, because I have links in this particular slide. So if you want to look at the cat API, for example, look at that cat. It looks like it's brooding. Um, or you want to use one of these other APIs, Smash Lounge API for Smash characters. Um, I have quick links, but if there's something else that you find more interesting, you can feel free to use that as well. Finally, I have the option if you'd like to take your learning even further, you can become a Postman student expert. So our student expert training is a free self-paced certification. Um, it's, that's online. You'll learn about doing more sophisticated requests in Postman, um, editing documentation, writing scripts inside Postman to kind of automate the process a little bit more, and um, passing data between requests. And so once you have finished this training, if you choose to do it, you'll get a certified badge that looks like this. It'll be an open badge that you can put on um, Twitter, LinkedIn. If you put it on LinkedIn, you're allowed to put it in um, your, allowed to put it in your education on LinkedIn, and we've actually had more than a few people get job interviews, and in some case, pay raises um, for having their certified student expert badge in LinkedIn. Um, so there is something to help you in your job hunt too, if you're actively searching for a job. Finally, I have some resources for you, our learning center, which has all of our documentation, the Explore Network, if you want to see what other people are creating, and our community forum for any question that didn't get answered in this. Finally, if we have questions, I know that we are right at time, so I want to be respectful of everyone else's time. Um, you can send me your questions to my email. How to create a fork? You missed it. I know that the session has been recorded and it will be um, posted 
on YouTube, I believe. So you can go back through the recording of the session and learn how to create a fork there. Um, do you need any credit for using the Spotify API? The Spotify API is free to use. Um, so you can, all of, the, all of the APIs that I shared are free to use. Um, so you can use those there. Um, awesome, I'm glad that you liked it. I'm sorry that I'm kind of rushing at the end. I just wanna be respectful of people's time. I put my email in the chat. If you think it was, ah, ah, thank you, Joy. Um, if you think that this was helpful, please, please, please fill out the survey link. Um, you can use the one that I sent in the chat. I can send that one again. Um, or you can use the one that is in the uh, slides, but either is okay. You can also feel free to add me on LinkedIn. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them on LinkedIn as well. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. Um, and yeah, that's all that I have for you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Bye, y'all.